coming to you from Belfast. Behind me you can see Harlan and Wolf, where Titanic was built, and the Lagan. Um, and I'm here to welcome you to Atheism for Lent 2023. Thank you so much for being part of this journey with me. Um, I know some of you have done it before, uh, some of you this is the first time. Uh, so whether you're a veteran or a newbie, you're very welcome. Uh, I'm excited to maybe get to know you a little bit during the live seminars, although I know a lot of you will be watching after the fact. Um, what I want to do with this short video is just kind of introduce you to what this uh, decentering practice is, give you a little bit of advice as to how to get the best out of it, and, uh, and then introduce the first three reflections. This is kind of like the foothills uh, before we get into the, the main meat of the course. So I mentioned it as a decentering practice, and that's what I call uh, the um, uh, Omega course, the uh, Last Supper, the Advances in Project, and Atheism for Lent. These are all decentering practices. And they're called decentering practices because, in a way, they disrupt us. They're designed to disrupt and uh, disturb you and potentially shake things up. So, centering is always very nice to do, but often in any discipline, movement forward happens whenever there is conflict, when there's antagonism, when there is a disruption in the way we see things in the kind of common sense of the word, the sorry, common sense of the world. And in a similar way, decentering practice is designed to not so much uh, create a disturbance within you, but to kind of expose how there always is a kind of disturbance in us. To be human is to always have the potential of being thrown off course, something happening which helps open up the world in different, uh, more fertile ways. So Atheism for Lent is going to do that, and it, it is kind of about the relationship between theism or affirmation and atheism, negation. So often, think, you can think of the progression of thought as someone puts up a position then maybe somebody critiques that position and then through that debate another kind of more nuanced position can often arise. Um, but interestingly, uh, it's not that the critique is always from without. So you have a position, someone else critiques it, someone else critiques them. Um, often what you discover is whatever position you take, it kind of has within it the seeds of its own destruction. And as you go deeper into a position, it kind of cracks apart and something else births. And then as you go deeper into that, that kind of begins to crack apart and something else emerges. And this is called dialectics, this dialectic process. And that's what we're gonna explore over the next 40 days. And it's an, ex it's an intellectual exploration uh, but it's also a personal and existential one. In many ways, I want you to feel the movement um, as you go through each of these daily devotions. Um, I know a lot of it will be quite intellectual um, because a lot of people, a lot of you enjoy that kind of thing, but I, I think there's enough in it that I think it'll be personally enriching. Um, now, let me think of some advice to give you. I've been doing this for decades. Uh, so have I got any advice if this is the first time you've done it? Um, okay, well, the first thing to say is congratulations if you do everything, right? But don't worry, right? If you do half the material, that's very, very good. Every day you will get an email sent to your inbox. And I would advise you maybe even create a folder, Atheism for Lent, and you can drop all of the emails into there. And as I say, you may get through it all, or you may get through half the material, or you may just do two reflections a week, but you will have it all there for the rest of your life. And not only will you have 40 odd daily reflections, you'll also have lots of secondary material. Each email has kind of further resources if you want to delve deeper. So basically you're going to have enough material to keep you going for years. Um, so yeah, don't worry about doing it all at all just do what you can it would be better for you 
to do a couple of reflections really slowly and take your time with them and go out for a walk and let them kind of permeate you than doing all of them and not having the time to let them sink in. So if you're gonna, you know, make the choice, you may be quite obsessional and you like to do everything, I get it. <laughs> um, I'm like that. But um, I would recommend if you can't, if you're gonna be stuck for time, do less and do it slowly. And then as I say, maybe over the course of the next few months, look at the other material. Uh, related to that, um, if you're wondering, well then how do I know which two reflections I should pick in a week? Um, I would recommend that you listen to my seminar on the Sunday. So every Sunday I'll give a live seminar. Uh, you can watch it live and participate or you can watch it later. And in those seminars, I will be giving a bit of an introduction to the readings of that week. So if you listen to that talk, not only will you get a sense of the entire week, even if you don't do it, uh, you also might be able to go, okay, the one on Tuesday, that sounds really interesting. And the one on Thursday, that sounds very disturbing. So I definitely want to do that. So I'll do Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and, and on the theme of disturbance, third bit of advice. Um, uh, the, the real challenge is to kind of let these different devotions, the different reflections um, uh, make an imprint to kind of walk around and to feel them. So I would say as much as possible, try not to agree or disagree with what you encounter, at least initially. Because often when you get something and you've got two boxes, agreement or disagreement, it's a real good way of domesticating the material. So you just put it into one of the boxes. Um, it's much more difficult to stop yourself from doing that and just kind of allow it to percolate. So really entering into the feel of it is what's of primary importance. And then of course you can, as you want, and with, in discussion with others, you know, find what you, what you find uh, persuasive and what you find not persuasive. But first and foremost, let them wash over you, even if you don't understand them. Actually, don't worry about that. If there's some reflections that are complicated, just read them, let them sit with you. Sometimes a week later or a month later, it will become clear. On Sundays, uh, I think it's at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, but that will be in the email. There's an optional processing room that will be led by uh, my friend Kate, who has done this course and helps me with a lot of my work, uh, Kate Burgess. And she'll be creating a space where people can just come into the room and talk about what they felt about the reflections of the previous week. And that's a chance to hear other people's thoughts. And that might be when things make sense. You might encounter something and it doesn't make sense. The processing room is the place to go. That's, that's where you can discuss it with other people. Uh, treat this like an album, or maybe treat this like seven albums. And each of the albums has a number of tracks. Uh, some of the tracks will really touch you and move you, and some of them will leave you cold. It's totally fine, that's gonna happen. I would say if you get four or five of these reflections that really do something to you, that's, that's worth it. Um, and I actually think you'll get more. I think you'll get more than that. But even if you, know, you do four or five in a row that leave you cold, uh, keep going because the sixth one might be something that, that really makes you think differently, that decenters you in that really productive way. All right, there you go. Um, what I want to do now is just introduce the first few reflections. This is the foothills, the beginning. Uh, next week, we get into the core of it. Now, what I've done this year is, right, this is Atheism for Lent, and often we begin with the classic critiques. But this year, I'm starting with the classic, um, I'll say for now, arguments for the existence of God. Just three days of it. Three days where you're going to be able to sit with three, um, actually more than three, you're going to get uh, 
depending on how you count it, six or seven, right, in the next three days, arguments that have been used uh, to, if not prove the existence of God, that to kind of lead to the probability or possibility of the existence of God. So I'm going to go through each of the three reflections um, and then that's going to set us up for next week when we do a critique of them, when we do a critique of traditional theism. So tomorrow we're starting with one of the most famous, or the most famous set of arguments um, for the existence of God. Now, I keep hesitating when I say arguments for the existence of God because I don't really think that's what they are. Right? This is Thomas Aquinas and his famous five ways. So Thomas Aquinas famously in his uh, great theological work, the Summa, he um, gave five, um, you could say descriptions of what we call God, right? And there are dozens of different uh, forms of these arguments, right? Um, you know, I've seen, you know, over 20 different variations that I've, that I've studied uh, early on in my uh, philosophy course, um, in my philosophy studies. So there's lots of variations, but they actually basically all come down to these five, right? Aquinas listed these five very famous arguments, and they're called a posteriori arguments, a posteriori, which means after experience. And what that means is these are arguments that rely on our experience of the world. Right, very basic experience of the world, but they rely on our experience of the world. Um, the other types of argument are called a priori, and that means before experience. So a posteriori means arguments that rely on some experience of the world. And a priori means an argument that doesn't require any experience of the world. So for example, if I, if I, wanted to find out how people were going to vote i would have to go into the world and i'd have to do research so i'd have to use experience but if someone asked me are all bachelors unmarried i wouldn't have to do any research um, i could through pure reason work out that no bachelor is married because the very definition of bachelor is unmarried man right so one is a, poster a posteriori you go into the world and you have to study. The other is a priori. It means you don't have to go into the world. You can know it through pure reason. So tomorrow you're going to get the five big a posteriori arguments. But you will notice that at the end of each one, and they're all just a paragraph each, at the end of each one, Thomas Aquinas finishes, I think it's saying, and this is what we call God. Uh, so it's not, he doesn't finish by saying, and this is a proof of God. He said, this is what we call God. So it's almost as if Aquinas is kind of like helping us understand what the definition of God is. Right? Goes, this is the definition of God. And he calls them the five ways, or we call them the five ways, not the five proofs. So they are logical. They are attempting to clarify in our minds what we mean by the word God and they have been used as proofs for the existence of God and they've been critiqued as proofs and there's arguments for and against but a lot of people including a lot of contemporary thinkers and popular thinkers like Richard Dawkins and others often misunderstand these, these as arguments as proofs when as I say Thomas Aquinas doesn't call them that at all he simply seems to be saying here's a definition of what we mean when we're talking about God. Um, and that's worth bearing in mind. And the five ways, in brief, uh, these, and these are all versions of what's called the cosmological argument because they all require a look at the cosmos, our experience of the cosmos, right? So they're a posteriori because it's about experience and it's about experience of basic dimensions of reality. These are not um, uh, experiences of a particular thing, like a particular animal, or like I used the voting example, particular voting habits of people. This is our basic experience of the universe and of our place in the universe. 
So what I would like to do is just go through the five ways very quickly. You're going to read them yourself, but I'll just give you a little overview. The first way of Aquinas is the idea of an unmoved mover. Aquinas looks at the world. Remember, this is about the cosmos. We look at the cosmos and we see things in movement. We see planets in movement. We see people in movement. We see objects in movement. And Aquinas says, well, everything has to move because of something else, something acting upon it. So all of this movement relies on other things pushing against them, causing that momentum. And Aquinas says, well, the problem is if you can't go back infinitely, right? Eventually you have to go back and find that there is a first mover, some mover that gets everything else going and sustains everything else. And that first mover isn't moved by anything else. It has to be moved by itself. It's an unmoved mover. And he says that that's what we call God. So that's the first way. He says something that gets everything in movement, because again, we see everything in movement. There has to be some unmoved mover. Secondly, he makes an argument from causation. He also looks and says, well, everything that we witness is the result of a cause, an effect of a cause. So there's this chain of cause and effect. But again, he says, well, if you go back far enough, you have to kind of postulate uh, an uncaused cause. Something that causes everything, gets everything moving, but is itself uncaused. Uh, that births everything, but is itself unbirthed. And again, he says, well, that's what we call God. And then connected to this, these arguments are all quite closely connected. There is the argument of a necessary being, where he says another thing we see about the universe, the cosmos, is that everything exists contingently. Everything we see happens to exist. Uh, it could not exist. And it goes into existence and goes out of existence. And he says, well, you know, for anything to have started, anything to have come into existence, we have to postulate something that exists of necessity, right back at the beginning, that brings everything else, gets this chain of cause and effect started, right? Um, and Aquinas is technically not talking about a chain of cause and effect, actually. Um, that's what's called the Callum argument. Uh, but Aquinas is saying that everything almost, it's like a chandelier that has a chain, right? Say you see a chandelier and it has a chain going up and you can't see where the chain is uh, hooked into. You can't see where it's anchored. But you know it must be anchored somewhere because it's, it's holding up. Right? If it wasn't anchored, it would fall to the ground. And Aquinas is saying something similar, which is the whole universe is kind of held up. All these contingent things are held up. And although we can't see what they're held up by, it must be something. And that something has to exist of necessity, not of contingency, has to necessarily exist, cannot not exist, exists of and by itself. And he says, that's what we call God. So in these first three arguments you've got, he says, if, you want, if you're wondering what we mean by the word God, we're not talking about Zeus. We're not talking about, you know, some bigger version of ourselves. Um, we're talking about an unmoved mover, an uncaused cause, and a necessary being. And then the final two, um, which are a bit more controversial. One, Aquinas says, everything we see has degrees. There are degrees of goodness, there's degrees of justice, degrees of truth, degrees of knowledge. So we can, you know, see that someone is better than somebody else. Um, he says that this idea of good and better leads us to postulate a best, right? That makes sense of good and better. So we almost need like a, a, a measuring rod to be able to make these kinds of distinctions. And God, is the maximally great, maximally truthful being, right? God is that kind of like greatest being. So there's another, another thing to add on to the definition of what we mean by God. And then finally Aquinas says, uh, oh yeah, everything in the universe 
kind of seems to, and I'm gonna, maybe I'll put this in slightly modern terms, but there's like an order to the universe, like a mathematical structure to everything. Um, things are not random. There's, there's kind of like things have purposes and ends. They, and he's not talking about like intelligent design or anything like that. He's talking about, in some respects, the constants of the, of the universe. And he said, you know, this notion of these, of these constants um, postulates an intelligence um, at the core of everything that holds it all together. And he says, and again, this we call God. So these are five ways, five ways of trying to almost, it's, I like to think of them as clarifications of what we mean by this word God. But also there's a, there's a logical dimension to them, which have been used by some people to try to say, as I say, the notion of God is, in the words of someone like Richard Swinburne, uh, probabilistic. Um, Okay, so this, that's tomorrow. Sounds like a lot you're doing, but actually I say they're only a paragraph each. And it's such an important part of medieval thought that it's actually just really good to know it and to, to actually read it. Then the next day, you're going to get um, a relatively modern version of one of those arguments, of the fifth argument. Um, and it's by William Paley. And oh, I think it's the 16th century. Oh, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, it is likely the most persuasive of the arguments. None of the arguments are very persuasive, really, but it's probably, the, in historically speaking, the one that people find most intuitively persuasive. And ironically, it's probably the weakest of the arguments, right? So it's kind of the most persuasive and the weakest. But you know, it's William Paley saying that the world is uh, complex, has all of these complex features, and this leads us to the idea that there is an intelligence behind the universe. He says it would be like finding a watch in a field. When you find the watch, you postulate the existence of a watchmaker. So when we see the world, we postulate a world maker. Now, I'm not gonna go into the critiques of this. I think in the secondary literature, you'll, you'll see some of that. And also you can do you know, your own research on this and there's lots of good critiques of it. The main thing is Darwin. Um, Darwin um, kind of made short shrift of this argument eventually. Like, and Darwin found this argument very persuasive at one point. And, but he found a way of describing complexity that didn't require in, an external intelligence. So you can see this argument as kind of like, uh, kind of persuasive, but also how Darwinian kind of evolution uh, offered a way of explanation that didn't require an external intelligence. And then finally, in the day three, you will encounter an argument that is a priori. And a priori, as I mentioned earlier, is prior to experience. Now, Anselm is the most famous version of this. Uh, I don't think we're going to do him this year because we've done him previous years. But I took Descartes because Descartes has a version that's just as good. And De it's a very strange argument. And it's the kind of argument that you definitely will want to go for a walk and think about. And sometimes you'll just see it like one of those 3D pictures. It'll make no sense. And then you'll kind of it'll make sense for a second and you might lose it because it's a very strange argument. But I'll try and do justice to it. And this is the hardest reading of this week and it's the hardest reading probably of the next couple of weeks um, so don't worry too much um, if you don't get it but basically Descartes saying that in our minds we have lots of ideas of things that may not exist in reality so we can think of a triangle and a triangle having three sides and we can also, if we're mathematical, we can have all these kind of, we can understand what a triangle is. And we don't have to encounter triangles in the world in order to have an idea of a triangle. Um, so you could even think of a shape that you've definitely never seen in the world. So you can think of shapes that you've never seen. So there's concepts in the mind that make sense, that have definitions. So a triangle has three sides. Uh, you could define anything you want all in the mind, doesn't matter if it exists in reality, in your mind, 
you've got all sorts of ideas about dogs and cats and telephones and televisions and everything. Now, uh, the thing about all definitions is nothing has to exist. You can think of Sherlock Holmes, greatest detective who never lived, you know, the, or Columbo's better probably, but um, in my opinion. Uh, you've got lots of Santa Claus, unicorns, You've also got horses and cows, things that do exist in the world. You've got all these ideas and none of them have to necessarily exist, right? Even though there are horses in the world, we can imagine something happening and horses going extinct. We can still have an idea of a horse, right? It doesn't require horses to exist. Right, this is the weird bit. It's just that, right, there's one exception to this idea um, of things existing in the mind but not existing in reality. And it's God. Because Descartes basically says, right, the definition of God, and we can actually use Aquinas here a little bit, right? We've already said whether God exists or not, you know, God is the unmoved mover, the necessary being, the greatest, maximally great being, the, or, the, the organizer of fundamental uh, features of the universe, right? This is what we mean by God. Descartes says, okay, so one of the things we mean by God, when we say God is maximally great, right, has the maximum greatness of everything, right? All great making things God has. God's essence, right? And um, to think of an essence, what an essence means is, like I'm imagining the essence of a triangle, three-sided shape, right? It doesn't need to exist. Essence and existence. I can think of the essence of an umbrella, when an umbrella of... You know, a device that keeps you, a portable device that keeps you dry, right? So I can think of the essence of an umbrella doesn't have to exist. Essence and existence. Well, the essence of God is to have every great making uh, thing. Everything that is, max, is good, God has it to the maximum. That means that the definition of God must include necessary existence. Right? Because that's a maximally great thing, right? Better to exist than not to exist, and better to exist of necessity, which means you cannot not exist. You have always existed, you always will exist, and you're the cause of your own existence, right? Necessary existence is better than contingent existence. So the very definition of God, the essence, when you're defining the essence of an umbrella, it doesn't include existence. If you're defining the essence of a triangle, it doesn't include existence. But when you're defining the essence of God, in that definition, it includes necessary existence. So if you say to me, God does not exist, what you're saying to me is God, who must exist of necessity, does not exist. In the pool dictionary, there's only one concept that requires existence in this definition is God. Nothing else does. You can describe horses, they don't have to exist. You can describe cars, they don't have to exist. Existence isn't part of a definition of anything except for God. And, uh, and so weirdly, logically, um, we find ourselves affirming the existence of God just by using the very word God. Like that. Hope that wasn't too confusing. I apologize. I mostly just want to welcome you, say, get you started on this journey. Uh, I hope you have a good time doing it. I say the first three days are just getting a vibe for some of the arguments for, and then on Sunday, I'm going to introduce the classic critiques. And from there on, it gets much more interesting. Then we get into the mystics, we get into the existential theologians and into some contemporary stuff. So good luck, I uh, wish you the best, and uh, I will see you in Sunday. Bye-bye.